Welcome to the Gentleman Project Podcast. I'm Kirk Chug. And I'm Corey Moore. Today we have with us, kind of famous in our life, right? Yeah. Yeah. Big part of my life. Brady McIntyre. And uh, we both know him. Kirk and I know him because he runs a place that is probably the coolest place in Utah, maybe anywhere, called Max Place. And uh, we'll let Brady describe Max Place for us and how that all came about. But Brady, thanks for being with us. I'm honored. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So Brady, tell us about Max Place just a little bit, and then we're going to go into a little bit about Brady the man and Brady the family man and how Max Place came to be. But I think it'd be kind of cool for everybody to hear the description from the owner of what's Max Place. Yeah, you bet. Well, it's definitely the coolest place in the basement of the building on the corner of 3rd South and 3rd West, that's for sure. (laughs) Um, Max Place is a, uh, we struggle with what to call it. You, You really have to be there. To, to, yeah. to grasp what it is, but I, I call it a, a business social club. It's like an, a downstairs speakeasy-ish uh, little social club with really high-end antique decor in the place. It's a very relaxing place. It's a disconnect from technology and from all the busyness outside. And we have a, a barber shop in there. You can get a straight razor shave and a face massage, a haircut. I mean, very, very high end, very high quality. We have massage therapists that do seated massages. They're all just fantastic. We've got a shoe shiner that does shoe shines. He does all kinds of leather care. Sneakers are big right now. We do a lot of cleaning and conditioning sneakers. And people are crazy. They're walking around the street in, you know, vintage Twenty thousand dollars yeah. sneakers, yeah. It's it's nuts. And then they walk in and ask my guy to clean them, and my when my guy finds out, you know, <laughs> those shoes are fifteen grand. It's, it's a, little, a yeah. little more iffy with the cleaning. <laughs> it's 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 giving him some growth yeah, for sure. Funny. Well, yeah. when did you open? Now, how long has it been? Now, I can't remember. We opened our doors the end of October in twenty nineteen. Ooh, that's a good time to open a social club right before COVID hit. Yeah, I have to say though, so I heard about this from a, from a friend. And I went over there, I think, I don't remember. I think I just went over there and found you guys. Or maybe I called Brady first. I think I did. I think I called you and then walked over there. And I joined pretty much immediately because you just don't find a place like this. It's just really cool and hip and fun. But it's mostly, you know, business people around Utah that are members. And so um, over time, it's definitely become more social. Right. But it's just a place that, you know, you want to be because it just makes me feel like a better man because I'm in this environment of, you know, this cool stuff. Yeah. Well, there's just successful people around. I introduced a couple of very successful clients to each other yesterday and at Max Place and both of them were very impressed and wanted to come back. So it's a it's a pretty neat space and a, a great, great place. So all around there are you said high-end vintage antiques and things like that. I kind of grew up in that same space where my dad loved that type of a thing. And I was in lots of antique stores and um, collectible shops all over the place. That's kind of what we did uh, when I was a kid. So tell us where it came from for you and why you're so passionate about that type of a thing. Yeah, you bet. Um, Yeah, here we go. This is, uh, this is the max place story long ways for me. Yeah. I, my dad was an old hot rodder. We've had a car in the garage, an old hot rod for as long as I can remember. Um, and, and along with that just kind of came old gas pumps, old signage, old parts hanging on the wall. I mean, it's just, it was just an environment for me that I really enjoyed. Yeah. It was a hobby to begin with. And it eventually spanned into a little bit of a business for he and I. We started restoring old gas pumps, um, collecting old signs, selling old signs. And this was back in the, you know, the early nineties. Nobody was doing that stuff. In fact, we had, we had a little business where we would build these neon clocks. They were vintage looking neon clocks and it was hard to sell this stuff. There was maybe 10 or 12 people in Utah at the time that collected this stuff. And your dad was probably one of my them. dad has some of your dad's signs in his garage. Yeah. 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 So, but th- at the time there was this crazy new website that we discovered called eBay. <laughs> eBay. <laughs> yeah. That's how long ago this was. And so we started putting uh, these neon clocks on eBay 
and people were buying these from all over the world. It, it was just crazy. I couldn't believe it. And we, we talked to the manufacturer and th- this was such a learning thing for me about business. Uh, we, we discovered that they could build the clock, put our sticker on the back and ship it directly to the guy buying the clock. Like drop shipping that, that, Drop shipping blew my mind. Blew, blew your mind. Yeah. <laughs> whole new, a uh, whole new thing that I'd never thought of. And so all of a sudden my job was I'd show up in the morning, pull up our email, which was also, you know, groundbreaking, novel, crazy. Uh, and I'd have a list of clock orders and I would print those out and stick them in the fax machine and fax them over to the, the manufacturer to ship these out. Mm. And that's it. And money would go in the bank account, and we couldn't believe it. And and it's not that we made a lot of money. We were doing this at the time out of this tiny little log cabin used car lot that was ours. That you know we were peddling really cheap used cars just to make a living. And uh, business was so bad that we got into this stuff with the clocks and the gas pumps and restored old Coke machines. And all of a sudden we're doing stuff for restaurants locally and for the Harley dealership and we did a gas pump for Carl Malone back in the day. And we just did a lot of, uh, a lot of cool stuff, but that's really kind of where it started from. So it was kind of a passion project, father, son, tell everybody a little bit about that relationship with your dad and the influence that he had in your life and where you are today and the success that you've seen today. For sure. So we, we didn't know it at the time, but it it was a passion project. But at the time, in the thick of it, we were trying to make enough money to pay the bills. You know, if I, if I go back a little further, my, my dad's been in the car business his whole life and he opened up a Ford dealership in Arizona, took a big risk, uh, got some investors, got the Ford franchise, moved his family to this tiny little town. Nobody wanted to go. And we went out there, which I've got to give a huge shout out to my mom for supporting this. It's amazing how I, it took me a while. Uh, you know, I had to get to a certain age before I realized what a big deal that was. Wow. <laughs> the backbone behind all of this was my mom's support of my dad being a hardworking individual, right? That's, it's really easy to say that hard work is not going to be good for everybody because it takes up all your time. But to have mom step up, be the backbone, support it, fill in where dad couldn't. uh, I didn't see that as a kid. At any rate, a big shout out to her for that. Uh, But we we moved out to this little town. Uh, Business was successful for a while. We were there for about four years. And then a series of events shut down the dealership. And we lost everything. I mean, we, we packed up whatever we could fit in a minivan, a Ford Aerostar, which I'm, I'm not positive, but I think my dad may have stole that from the dealership we just closed. <laughs> and how old are you at this time? <laughs> I would have been uh, moving back. It was just in eighth grade, like eighth the middle grade. of eighth grade. Okay. And we came back bankrupt, uh, nowhere to go. We lived in a little motel. For a little while, I remember telling kids at this new junior or new middle school that I had to go to, I was telling me, I, I have a pool at my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Because so we, we live in this little motel. That's great. Um, so many stories with all of this. We had parakeets as pets and we brought them with us. And it was such a fiasco <laughs> that we forgot and we left them in the car the first night. And it was in the middle of the winter. And it was... Months later, it dawned on me that my parakeets are gone. I have no idea where my parakeets are. And my dad <laughs> broke the news that, yeah, the <laughs> suckers froze solid. Like, Sorry, one. son. Yeah, so they're gone. He <laughs> oh, man. And, yeah, he tossed them. Um, it, it was a really interesting experience. But we, we came back to Utah broke and, you know, nothing to do, nowhere to go. But the one thing that we could still go do is go look at old cars and we had a we had a great time doing that. We ended up finding a cheap old car in the newspaper, uh, in the washer and dryer section because my dad was looking for a dryer, a used dryer <laughs> for cheap. And we ended up buying this car, and it just had a lot of character. I still have this car to that day. It's it's like a member of the family. 
You still have it today? <clears throat> I do. Oh, what wow. Is okay. What is it? What, it's yeah, a what, 1954 yeah. Chevy Bel Air. Hmm. That's an nice. incredible car. And he, and he hung on to it during other hard times. When, when I went on my mission, he, he could have sold that thing. They needed the money. And, and he hung on to it. And so it's, you know, definitely a family heirloom. Yeah, that's um, cool. But we came back, you know, no money, no nothing, just uh, starting from scratch. But we really, that was just the thing we did together was old cars and old motorcycles. And it started blossoming into other stuff. And then when I was in high school, I'd take off in a truck and trailer and go drive around, I don't know, four or five states and, and buy out old gas stations that were boarded up. I would uh, buy gas pumps. What I, mean, I could come home with a truck and trailer full over a weekend. It was just everywhere back then. And we, mm. we had a big junkyard of gas pumps and parts and we could restore these gas pumps and we had all the parts we needed and we were just cranking this stuff out. And, you know, at the time it was just making ends meet, right? You know, we had nothing better to do at the time. That's all we knew. So how long did you do that? Like how, what time frame are we talking about? Well, we did that from, uh, I would say probably 88, 89. And we did, um, we opened up a little outlet in an outlet mall, built this little gas station facade and we're selling, you know, nostalgia items out of there. And, and that was kind of fun. Didn't make much money. Uh, what I didn't know was going on is my dad was taking every one of these opportunities that we could find and just kind of setting it on in my lap and say, Hey, let's, cool. okay, take this. Let's do this. Uh, it was training. I, you know, I never saw it in a million years, but looking back on all this stuff, he was, you know, he wasn't in business to be in business. He was teaching his kids. He was teaching you business and entrepreneurship and sales and communication and you name it, all the stuff that quite frankly, probably makes you who you are today. Yeah. And you know, the, the biggest thing I think I learned through all of this with him is the importance of just good, solid relationships. And there's a, a big spider web of things that tie to that integrity and you know all, all of those things. But uh, the importance of relationships is just crucial. That's in your family. That's in your business relationships. That's, that's everywhere. So I see that being a member of Max place. And your last name is McIntyre, but everybody called your dad Mac, right? That's right. Yeah. So you named the business after your dad. Yeah. It was, it was a nod to him because a lot of the stuff that's in there was stuff that he and I collected. And I think that'd be a place he would love to sit down and hang out if he was with us. He, he passed away. Uh, it'll be 10 years in March. And so this was something that I could create and still kind of, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is a twisted way to live, but I feel his presence there a little bit and I feel like I can still spend time with dad. Yeah, that's cool. Is your mom still alive? She is. Yeah. She okay. lives, she lives down in St. George. She's, she's doing great. That's she's good. still the backbone of everything. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So tell us a little bit about your family and then um, maybe some of the things that you've tried to pass on to your kids, like things that you learned from your dad and maybe what do they think about Max Place? I'm giving you multiple questions. I apologize, but I'm just excited to hear about, you know, what, what's going on in your, your immediate family. Sure. So I have uh, my youngest daughter is 10 years old and she just, you know, she, she rules everything. Uh, she's the boss. I have twin daughters that are 16 they're just getting into the cars and getting that freedom, right? And I, I want to lock everybody down. <laughs> can. Um, and I have a uh, stepson, Land, and he's out of the house. He's kind of doing his own thing. And, um, you know, he'll, he'll be getting into business. He's really entrepreneurial-minded, a hardworking kid. So there's, there's potential there. But he's still young enough that it, it takes some work. So um, that's the that's the kid situation at home. And when I think about what am I, you know, what am I doing to teach them things? I panic because I immediately think I should be sitting down with them every day and doing some specific things to teach them, you know, the right things. And, and I don't, and I, I, I know they watch what I do and they watch what their mom does. And I'm thankful that their mom is, is a great example to them. She has a career as well. And she's 
super busy. So between the two of us, you know, we're trying to juggle our relationship, trying to juggle the kids, all of that stuff. It's a story you've heard before, right? We're just super busy. It's the story of all of our lives. Mm -hmm. It's the story of all of our lives. You do most of your teaching through example, which sometimes is good for me and sometimes is bad for me, but that's, that's kind of where it comes from. Right. And then, uh, you know, you might have some religious, um, things that you teach them that helps with some of these true North principles as we call them. Right. But we're all in that exact same boat. That's actually why we started the podcast in the first place was, Hey, we should talk about anything purposeful that we might be doing or yeah. mantras that we use as a family or traditions that we have as a family, or, you know, some of those kind of things are really what make up how you raise your kids. Right. Yeah. It's those yeah. little things. Just yeah. planting a seed for somebody who might be listening to say, you know, the way your dad helped raise you and incorporating you into his passions and his life and the things that you guys liked to do together has made you who you are and you're very successful, very well connected um, and have so many opportunities because of those relationships that he helped you know were important, how to build those relationships. Um, yeah. Like anything like that, that, uh, that you're doing right now with your kids that like might be novel or cool. Yeah. You know, when I, when I think about, what you just said about how my dad did it with me. I don't think he sat down and, and specifically did certain things with me either. I, I learned from his example. Um, and so I'm sure my kids are soaking up some of that, but we do talk a lot. We, our family, for whatever reason, we're a magnet for the most bizarre scenarios and occurrences <laughs> on the planet. So we get, we're going to have to need, we're going to have to hear some of those. Now, yeah, so. so we, you know, it's, we do get, a fair amount of time to sit down and talk about funny things or odd things that have happened and how, how we deal with it. How do we approach it? What are our options? What are the possible outcomes? I'm a really big fan with my older girls uh, more specifically of trying to consciously do what my dad did and, and set the problem or the challenge in their lap and offer some guidance and in, in the form of asking some questions and how, how are you going to handle this and, and making sure they know that I will support them a hundred percent and be there to do whatever they need me to do. Um, it's interesting to watch a, you know, a 16 year old's mind piece together a, a fairly complex situation. And, and oftentimes they're smarter than you give them credit for. Now, they so are, you know, I, that's one of the nice things about older kids. Now, if I could just rewind, I'd have them all be two again. And I, cause I love that age, right? It's the greatest. They're not as smart when they're that age either. They're not as smart, but they're, <laughs> they don't talk back near as much. Yeah. Either. But there's this beautiful thing that happens, you know, around that, you, you know, somewhere between 12 to 14, where you can start imparting some pretty deep conversations, right? About real life stuff. You know, um, like I'm having my, my 15 year old read some books that are some of my favorite and she's internalizing them and we're talking about them. Right. And, uh, so it's fun, like you said, and I actually need to be better at that. That's going to be a takeaway for me. Brady is ask more questions, right? I'm, I'm always doing too much do this. And if you want that goal, don't you think you ought to do this, this, and this instead of saying, well, you told me you want that goal, right? Yeah. So what's your plan? Yeah. I do that at work way better than I do it at home. Like I'm always coaching our people here, right? Just, Hey, don't, if you're a leader, don't do it for them. Help them grow. Ask them what's your plan or come back to me with options and let's talk about it. I need to do that better with my kids. It's cool that you're doing that with your girls. Yeah. It's, it's hard, right? You, all of us in our careers we're we're trained to think, how do we, how do we drive this team? How do we push yeah. this team or this individual and get them to a certain level or a certain point? And with pushing or pulling comes resistance naturally. And that's hard with, with your kids. The, the thing you don't want is that resistance. And, um, if you can kind of be there as a support figure, there's nowhere for resistance to creep in. Uh, not that it never will, but you know, it's, I don't know. It's how, one of many strategies, I guess. How do you do with that? How do you deal with that? Like, are you good at, We've talked about a thousand times on the podcast. I'm not the greatest with patience with my kids. Um, but you seem like you're a pretty even kiln, easy to talk to, um, 
you know, don't get too excited about stuff. Are you that same way with your kids or are you different with your kids? Do you think? It would be fun to ask me that question, then ask my kids that question, and, and <laughs> then ask would. my wife that question. Might, yeah. That might be a good question for everybody to ask, and yeah. and then ask their kids that same question. I think they uh, they view me as probably fairly even killed, but they also know. Well, they tell me all the time, Dad, my friends are all scared of you. <laughs> <laughs> I get the exact same one. I get that all the time. So I don't know. Maybe that's a good thing when you have girls, right? As I, I kind of do want all their friends to be scared of me, but, uh, no, I don't know. That's a, that's a great question. Is it cause you're tall and you got the beard, you know, you think that's it or do you think it's personality thing? So here's something that won't come through on a podcast. I I've been told a lot that I, I just have a face that I look like I'm angry all the time and I'm not. You don't, I don't <laughs> think you have. I never thought that. that. People tell me all the time, that's you look funny. like you're angry and I, I'm having the best day yet. You know, I'm not super <laughs> happy to see you. Know, you look like you're really mad. <laughs> well, the shaved head and the beard is, and the flannel shirt, you know, the boots, that look in itself is, can be a little bit intimidating on a man of your frame. So that right? contributes. I, I think that's, that's it. I don't know. You have very kind eyes, Brady. <laughs> um, so d- when you say you talk to your kids about some of those things, is there, I like to kind of narrow it down to, what's the actionable item that I can take away from this? So at what point do you talk? Is it like, do you have a special place that you go? Do you go on drives? Is there a weekend that you kind of set aside? Do you guys talk over dinner? Um, Where do those conversations take place? Lately it's been over dinner. Um, I hate to say it, but starting a business, I I prepped everybody and let them know, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be MIA for like a year. And then I'll start to pull back and and spend more time. That year turned into three years quick, um, especially with the pandemic hitting. That was some curveballs that I don't think anybody was prepared for. Um, But lately it's, it's been over dinner a lot and um, driving. If we go on a little trip somewhere, we'll drive to St. George to go visit my mom. You know, we have some time to talk. Uh, My older daughters will sit up, stay up late with me a little bit, sit on the couch and chat. I wish we were better at being able to schedule some time with each one individually. Uh, that's one thing I've learned is, is crucial. It's easy to sit them down as a collective, but you're not getting the story from many of them, right? The right story. Yeah. Um, talking to them individually is, is a whole different ball game. Yeah. As part of my annual plan, I don't know how many times I've heard guests on the podcast over the last year and a half say, you know, having a scheduled time, each weekend, you know, I have four kids. There's four Sundays in a year. Each kid has a Sunday. We go for a walk or whatever. Um, and I sat down and I was like, you know how many times I've heard this? And I had done this, but I was never good at consistently doing it. Yeah, I've never been good at that. And so I've taken a page out of Rob Schellenberger's book and Corey Moore's book. And I have, at the end of every day, I have a list of things on my calendar that I have to do. And at the end of the day, I have a notification that pops up at 10 p.m. and it says clear your calendar, which means look over by your bed and see all the goals that you've set for yourself and all the promises that you've made and make sure that those things are done. And one of those promises is that I will have a one-on-one sit-down conversation with each of my kids during the month. And I'm just going to tell you, like, I've never been in the stage of parenting that I'm in right now. And none of us have which is kind of a thing that I've said since day one, like nobody has ever parented today's kids until this morning. It's a challenge every day to figure out how to do this thing. And hopefully the podcast helps lots of people. But um, those conversations that I have had in the month of January have been life memorable for me. Um, Hour and a half long conversations about pretty much every topic you can think about. So here's the thing that sticks out to me with that. Um, I'm, I'm envious that you have the self-discipline to make that happen. Because the one thing glaring me in the face is when my dad passed away, he's gone. It ends at that point, right? Then you can't say, okay, well, let's, let me shuffle some things around. I need to spend more time. Um, you know, we, we got a little bit of a heads up. He, had, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. He was a healthy guy. He was 68 years old. That's not very old. 
Oh, that's young. Yeah. And he woke up one morning, his foot didn't work. And went to the, long story short, he went to the doctor and they found a big tumor in his brain and they gave him, you know, three to six months. He lived five. Um, but it, it happens quick. And so I, you know, I look at my kids and think, I really, really need to sit down and spend as much time as I can with each of them. And I hate to say it, but then, then work pulls you away. And it's so hard to balance those. So, you know, huge kudos. No, I, I, I don't say that for kudos because I have been horrible at it. Even during the podcast when we were interviewing people and I think, man, that's a good idea. I should do that. Um, I mean, it's January, right? This podcast is going to drop at the beginning of February. It's only been like four weeks that I've done this. So um, it's, but I know it's valuable because of the conversations that I've been able to have with my kids. You know, um, my, my youngest came in on, I do them on Sunday afternoons and my youngest came in and I said, Hey, do you want to do your one-on-one? She's 10 too. And I said, do you want to do your one-on-one? And she said, what's that? Right. That's how good I am at this. She doesn't even know what it is. <laughs> And I said, it's just where you and I can sit down and, and talk. You can talk to me about school, friends, um, you know, issues that you're having maybe at school or with your brothers and sisters or, you know, things that you want to do or goals. At the end of that conversation, which lasted like an hour, um, we ended up, we were just laying there on my bed and it had gotten dark. So we're laying there together on my bed in the dark talking about the things that she wants to do. And she's like, will you help me? We got up and we went upstairs and printed off her goals. She had four goals that she set and she's hung them up and we're doing those goals. I'm like, that was a whole, the brought the byproduct of her setting and keeping commitments to herself came from me just saying, what are some of the things you want to do? Super cool. And so like, it's a culmination and I am a work in process because of the conversations that we've been having on the podcast. And I know that those are, valuable things and but it was it still took how many times of people saying this is a valuable thing for me to say i think i'll try that tell me about um what your kids think of max place do they think it's cool do they think it's just taking that away do they do they get it do they or do do they understand it yeah they they like the place they're always wanting to go hang out there which is hard because you know it's with the, the members that we have there, it's not the right place for kids to be running around at the same time. But um, no, they, they think it's really cool. They, they really do. And we've done a few things where we take the kids down when we're closed. And we, we slept there one night for New Year's. You know, we could go hang out downtown and then they could bring some friends. Then we went back to Max Place and they could turn the stereo up loud and, you know, just have lots of fun. And then we slept on the floor. It was the worst night of sleep I've had in a long <laughs> time, but, but, uh, they, they really like it. And I, you know, I think they understand why it's so demanding. That doesn't make it easier for any of us, but you know, they, they understand. And they're, they're way more clued in than you would think. You know, they, they bring stuff up every now and then that's details about something that I'm dealing with that I don't even know how they found out about it you know they overheard a conversation or something and then it makes me feel guilty that they're worried about me you know they're worried about my job and what i'm doing and uh, so it's it's interesting but but they like it i think overall it's definitely a good thing so what worries you the most as a as a father i think we all have kind of our own little worries and certainly each kid you have your own worries and maybe worry is the wrong word but no concern whatever are there things in for you that you think man i hope i can uh this worries me, or I hope this can, af- you know, that I can affect this. Oh, for sure. I, I mean, I, there's a new one every day, but I, I think to sum it up, technology really does. I, I think the kids, we're the really bad parents that take our kids' phones away. I, I've got strict rules on the phones. They don't go up in their bedrooms. They, they get turned in at night. You know, my wife and I both have really strict rules with these phones. Um, and, you know, the kids, it's like you tore their arm off or something when you take their phone away. But it terrifies me to see that their, their training on interacting is with an emotionless machine. And it's, that's scary to me. You know, I mean, 
going back to what we talked about earlier, relationships. How important are good relationships in your your interpersonal skills, how you deal with people and uh, being able to, I mean, everything from just facial expressions and body communication and all that stuff, it's non-existent on TikTok or Twitter or whatever they're using. Um, that that worries me because that's a, an emotional component that gets, they kind of get robbed of. And it's a, a really important piece. And I was talking with uh, some of our, We've got a few really tech savvy guys down at, at the club, some members of the club. And we were talking about this whole idea of the metaverse and what's happening there and how real it is and, and what the extremes could be where you could have somebody that is living in just a, a horrible scenario, struggling to even possibly even eat but on this fake virtual world, they could be this huge, important, famous guy. And most people in the younger generation would probably choose that huge, important, famous guy in fantasy land over, mm. you know, their own real, real life responsibilities in the real world. Um, that, that scares me because the, the reward systems and things that come along with, with tech is really kind of a false pat on the back for these kids. Um, I, I don't know how to get around that. Um, but that's, you know, that's what scares me a lot. And, and I think, I don't know, one of the reasons that scares me is we've, we've always had a, well, I should say I've always had this motto, if you will, that my dad would always give me. In fact, I remember uh, for quite a while, he would drop me off at school. And the last thing he'd say when I'm getting out of the car, he'd always say, hey, be, be a champion today, son. And so being a champion was huge for him, but he had his own definition of what a champion was. And his definition of a champion was uh, be the guy that's courageous enough to go sit with the kid that has no friends. Be the guy that'll go talk to the person that everybody's going to make fun of you for talking to you know be that guy that's just not worried about the consequences pick up someone's books if they drop their books stand up for the kid getting picked on sit with the kid that nobody sits with that was his version of being a champion um and i i think that develops a level of self-confidence in people that is just pays huge dividends because you don't you learn to not worry what everybody else thinks about you anymore. Yep. The popularity thing's not that big of a deal anymore. Doing the right thing is. How do, how do you do that in a virtual, <laughs> a fake environment, you know, with all this technology stuff? That's why it worries me so much is all they're chasing is the accolades. Um, you'll never see the guy that nobody will sit by in a virtual world. You'll never see that. You'll never see... You might see the person that's getting picked on, but it's really easy to go, oh, that poor kid's getting picked on. And there's 8 million other things to look at and see if you've got, you know, more likes. But that worries me a lot. I love that, that your dad, that you remembered that about your dad to be a champion. I think that that was your dad's definition of a gentleman, right? For sure. And the interesting thing to me one, it's interesting that that stuck with me so much. But as an adult looking at that, it was interesting to me that he was always telling me that you need to be looking outward. Be seeing what you can do every day for others, not what you can be doing just for yourself, right? Look for opportunities where you can lift somebody up a little bit. And the little things do matter. It's not a big deal to go sit by a, a, you know, a new kid that doesn't have friends yet. That's not a big deal. But so, yeah, I think it's interesting because it does change your focus a little bit. You got to look outward and man, if you can look outward, there's, there's endless opportunity to, to help lift people up. I mean, it's, it can be a pretty rough world. Yeah. Out there. What a reminder for the adults even that are listening to the podcast. You know, yeah. And is, I think, I think a key to that is breeding some confidence in your kids. I don't know how much, we, how much we've talked about that, but I think it's a super important part of raising children is giving them confidence in themselves 
because what you'll find, what I've seen is the conf, the more confident you are, the more apt you are to be the champion. Or as I think Derek Porter put it, root for the underdog, like be the underdog's person. Right. Um, I think all of us need to be better at talking to our kids of like your dad did. Cause it's definitely a problem. It, it was a problem when we were kids. It's probably a worse problem now because of social media and technology. Um, but I've, I've talked to my kids, not near as consistent as it sounds like your dad was, or you are with your kids, Brady, but I have talked to him about that. And, and then I'll watch, you know, my, my oldest daughter, she's, she's pretty confident. And I'll say, well, those kids that you're standing at the bus stop with, you didn't like smile and raise your hand and say, hi, you, you're not, why aren't you talking to them? And she just kind of looks at me like, well, I, why would I do that? I can't do that. I'm thinking, uh, yeah, you can. And, in, and that's like just a stepping stone on what you're talking about. Not only can you do that, you can go down to the end of the table to the person you've never met who's having lunch by themselves and you have no idea who they are and sit to them, next to them and say, hi, my name is, what's your name? Where are you from? You name it, right? I think we could breed that more into our kids, this outward. I love how you said there, the other problem with social is it, it seems as though certainly not everyone's this way, but it seems as though it's a very self-focused platform for most people, not for everyone. Some people are very focused on doing the right thing with social media, but to have our kids really be outward is super smart. So I'm going to have a great, great takeaway from that. So are there certain habits or things you've done with your kids or that your dad did with you? I mean, he talked about it. Um, and I need to talk about it more, more with my kids. Is there ways that you tried to show them examples when you're out and about, but how do you inspire that? I just kind of naturally try to mimic how my dad was. He was such a good example for, of that. And he, he was the first guy to just he'd be the first person to go put his arm around somebody and tell him that he loves them. And, you know, he just was that guy and everybody loved him for it. And he was, because of that, he was always just the center of, of a good, comfortable time with everybody. He was, the neighborhood kids loved him because he'd be playing with them. The neighborhood adults loved him because he was, uh, he was funny and had a sense of humor. But, but the point is he was, he was involved with everybody. And, and again, it's the relationships thing. I remember him telling me he got, he got called in his ward to be the ward mission leader. And the bishop asked him if he would do it. And he says, I will, but I'm going to do it my way, not yours. And the bishop said, well, what does that mean? And he says, that means I'm going to put my arm around people and tell them I love them and it's going to end at that. And he says, that's the piece that's, that's missing. And that was truly how he was. He wasn't looking for anything. He didn't have an agenda. He just cared about people. And so I'm, I hope that I, I can do that as well as he did so that my kids see that. I think they do. I really get a lot of enjoyment out of just being kind to people. It's, it's satisfying. It's fun. You, you meet people and uh, maybe I have to do that. You're in the perfect I, job for that, by yeah, the way. And maybe I need to do that because that gets me over the angry face that I have all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know that I, uh, I have this thing I do with my kids sometimes um, where we'll like judge customer service. So whether you're at a restaurant or you're going to pick up the dry cleaning or you're at a store, wherever, right? Like you're always interacting with people and it's, and I'm not sure if customer service or friendliness or just choosing to be happy. We're talking about all those things and then we'll just do like a great, I'll ask my kids after. So one to 10, how'd they do, you know? And, uh, I think what I'll do is I'll twist that a little and say, how did we do? Hmm. Like you, I, I always try to be kind to everyone and nice and whether it's no matter who it is. Right. But I think that outwardly vision of that, instead of how did they do, how did we do? What was our one to 10? What could we have done different would be, would be cool. Right. Who, how could we have been nicer? How could we yeah, have been idea. anyway? That's, that's what came idea. to mind when you were saying that. Cause that's kind of how you go about it is more, Hey, how are we doing in this world? You know, I, I like that. Can you think back to a memory with your dad? that was the coolest experience you ever had with him? Just one. Can you narrow it down yeah, to one? There was a lot. Um, 
I'll, I'll tell you what's funny. The one that popped in mind when you asked that, it was with my mom. And it was probably the biggest confidence booster for me as a kid. And, and the story's hilarious. It's not, it's not what you would expect <laughs> for a confidence booster, but it had a huge impact for me at a very young age. I was showing off for a couple of kids that moved into the neighborhood. We were buddies. This was like, I don't know, probably third grade, fourth grade. And I mouthed off to the neighborhood bully who was two years older than me. And uh, he was across the street. And I don't remember what I said, but I wanted my new friends to think I was a pretty tough guy. <laughs> so I said something to this guy. He says, what would you say? And I said, why don't you come over here? He goes, why don't you say it to my face? And I said, well, come over here, and I will. And he came across the street. And I was terrified, but I wasn't going to back down. And I said it to his face, and he just beat the crap out of me. He ended up, I mean, he knocked me against a car and kept punching me and hit me with the skateboard, hit me with my own skateboard after I fell down. And my two new friends ran. They hightailed it as soon as they saw I was getting, you know, beat up. But anyway, I, I headed home after the ordeal, and, and apparently I looked like I had been beat up pretty good. I looked, yeah. like, I looked how I felt. Um, I think one of my brothers looked at me and started laughing, but my mom says, what happened? And I told her, and I says, he hit me with my skateboard. And she got on the phone, called that kid's mom. And she said, that's not fair. You bring your son up here right now, and we're going to have him fight fair in the basement. (laughs) And I was sitting there going, no, I already been, I mean, he beat me up once. Are you kidding me, mom? I I know he can whoop me again. You know, this is crazy. And, but I sat there thinking, my mom has a lot of faith in me. Like she has got (laughs) a lot of unfounded (laughs) faith in me, but she was, I mean, she wanted, she was a hundred percent serious. And you know, the other guy's mom says, no, Rusty, that's probably not, you know, the right way to handle this. And, but. I saw after that time and time again, she had all the faith in the world in her kids. And, and not only that, she'd back it up. She had the faith to push them out there into these situations where she knew that they could handle it. And, and that stuck with me. So I, that was a huge turning point for me as far as confidence goes. And I've always um, been aware how important confidence is. In, in all kinds of situations, confidence in yourself, confidence in being able to handle the unknown if you're in an awkward situation, confidence to go sit by the kid that doesn't have any friends and not worry about it. So I, I could list out a thousand of these types of situations. I like those kind of stories too. too. Those are fun to listen That's to. That's a great story. <laughs> I do think confidence is something that we don't talk enough about, or at least I haven't. And it's such a huge thing. And, and, you know, when you say confidence, some people start thinking arrogance or some people start thinking, you know, something different than what confidence is. I'm talking about the confidence in, in yourself, but not arrogance, not, you know, a, a, a humble confidence, right? Um, just, and I think that's a problem with most adults. Most adults who have really hard times in their lives, you see this common thread of somewhere they lost confidence in themselves, Somewhere, somewhere they just, they, they can't get out of their own way because they don't have enough confidence to, to, to learn or to put someone else on a pedestal or to root for the underdog because, and usually that comes from a lack of self. So one of the best things, I'm glad you brought that up. One of the best things I think we can give our kids is the confidence that your mom has given you. You can do it whether you can or can't, you know, <laughs> like yeah. you can do it and you can do hard things and you know, just, just boosting them up and inspiring them to, to know that they can do anything they can, they put their mind to kind of a thing. So Kirk, you asked me what, you know, what does it mean to be a gentleman to me? I think that probably sums it up the quiet confidence to make the right decisions and do the right thing, whether it's visible or not. Love it. That's a gentleman. Love it. I'm, Mic putting, drop. That, I'm putting that on a poster. Mic drop. <laughs> Done. I like that one. <laughs> that, we haven't had that one. No, no. Cut, one. cut me in it's on great. the deal, though, on the poster. If you if you make it, <laughs> oh, we'll sell them <laughs> at Max the Place. There we go. <laughs> we'll sell them at Max Place. <laughs> we actually should sell like gentleman project stuff at Max Place. That would actually be kind of cool. Or giveaway would maybe yeah. a better word for it. But yeah, 
Yeah, I support like the, you guys. The Whatever journals, <laughs> you know, and the the stuff that people just tools of the parenting trade that we've heard yeah, of. Everybody's getting everybody's getting the inside track to the the brainstorming session that we haven't had yet. We're just doing the podcast and having fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. So, well, Brady, that was, that was great. Um, I'm looking forward to many conversations with you in the future, uh, in private about some of these lessons that your dad's taught you. It's cool to see a little piece of Mac in you and the place that you have there. That's a tribute to your dad and, and how he's influenced you to become who you are. And I've only known you for a short amount of time, but, um, I'm impressed by you and count you as a blessing in my life. So Thanks for being on the podcast today. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate being here. And, you know, your dad, you and your dad are in a similar boat as me and my dad. Yep. So uh, enjoy him to the max while you got him, because that's the one thing that everybody faces. You just don't know when. Yeah, kind of inevitable, isn't it? Yeah. Well, thanks for, thanks for being here. You're awesome. Thanks for everyone joining the podcast. Kirk, yeah, wanna... like, like, and subscribe to the podcast if you haven't. I mean, what's, what are you waiting for? <laughs> what are you waiting for? <laughs> Episode sixty six here. If you liked today's podcast, there's sixty five episodes that you can listen to, with uh, with good content and and amazing ideas for you to step up and be a high performing uh, influence in your family's life. Thanks for investing the time to be with us. If you like the podcast, share it with somebody. Act on each good thought and keep raising and being ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, everyone.